me know what you whisper. They have lost their protector. Now is our time to strike. You saw an underwater empire. This is what destruction sounds like. Yes, but these people are dangerous. There is a new world power at play. Are you an ally or an enemy? He's coming for the surface world. I don't think I can lose, brother. Blessed to be blacker than an African. In a world where they claim me I'm inadequate. You got some nerve. You got some nerve. Ask me why I walk around with attitude. 400 years, I was born to be mad at you. The dirt, the mob, we were set to succeed. The Black Panther This is what destruction sounds like. My ancestors would often say, only the most broken people can be great leaders. Introducing Namor was really an opportunity to introduce another sovereign ruler of a group of people. He shows up representing Talo Khan. He's coming for the surface world. In Marvel Publishing, Namor was one of the first superheroes, frankly. They called him Kukul Khan. The Feather Serpent God. Namor loves his people, and he's gonna protect them because to be a ruler, you have to serve the people. Talocan has a deep meaning for me. It's part of my personal heritage as a Mexican, as an inhabitant of uh, Mesoamerica. Finally, I could find a more powerful representation of my culture with dignity and respect. I cannot wait for everyone to see Talukan. I'm excited about how we're gonna see the world come alive. Both nations want the same thing, which is to preserve and to protect their people, but they're willing to go about it different ways. I need to know if Wakanda is an ally or an enemy. Namor is very much concerned with what he needs and what he wants. This delicate dance between the two of them. I get chills just thinking about it. You. My enemies call me no more. Welcome back, everyone. It's Charlie. Marvel dropped a couple new Black Panther Wakanda Forever trailers and clips, so we'll break it all down. There's a whole bunch of Easter eggs. Obviously, there's a bunch of big stuff coming up in Marvel Phase 5, and this is sort of like the last big thing in Marvel Phase 4, setting it all up. If you're brand new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to get all the videos. I believe I'm allowed to post my non-spoilery review on Tuesday, so that should be up by Tuesday morning. My full post credit scene video, Easter Eggs Breakdown of the entire movie, will post later next week after it actually comes out in theaters, so be sure to go see it as soon as possible. Because of what they're doing with the Ironheart Riri Williams character, I know there's a lot of questions about the legacy of Iron Man and Easter eggs during the movie and how they're going to deal with him going forward into Marvel Phase 5 and Marvel Phase 6 because we have Avengers 5 Kang Dynasty, Avengers 6 Secret Wars, a lot of Kang's technology iterates on things that Iron Man did. What are the big differences between Kang and the other people that sort of iterate on Iron Man's ideas and his technology to try and make it better is that Kang has just had millions of years because of the way that he plays with time travel. We'll start to see that during Ant-Man 3 Quantum Mania with the Kang the Conqueror version of his character, which is sort of like him in his prime. You also have to remember that Kang was born many, many thousands of years in the future, and the He Who Remains Immortus version of Kang that we saw during the Loki series was him at the end of all time, like the end of his timeline, but the end of all time in general, like the heat death of the universe billions of years in the future, so he'd had billions of years to make Iron Man's technology even better. It's sort of that idea that all technology is built on what came before. Like, oh, okay, that guy over there built these things. I think I can do a slightly better version using slightly different materials. And that's where you get to all the vibranium and all of Shuri's technology and her work in Wakanda. Because she's one of the few characters in the MCU that just doesn't immediately look at everything that Iron Man is doing and try to copy on it. This is one of the things they try to get across in the first Black Panther movie in Avengers Infinity War. And also what's going on in Black Panther Wakanda Forever with Namor's people in Talokan. Because those two cultures, like Talokan and Wakanda, are meant to be two different nations that were completely isolated from the rest of the world for most of their evolution. The only difference in present day is that T'Challa was trying to open their borders more and more at the end of the first Black Panther movie and allow more cultural influences into the country, which is where you get to all the Starbucks Wakanda jokes. 
When you said we are going to open Wakanda to the rest of the world, this is not what I imagined. And what did you imagine? The Olympics, maybe even a Starbucks. The idea in Black Panther Wakanda Forever is that it's just starting to happen to Namor's people in Talokan. Like, they're way more isolationist the way that the Wakandans used to be before T'Challa came along. So obviously during the movie, you have this very literal connection, Easter eggs through Riri Williams' Ironheart character, and they did have a much deeper connection in the comics, but because in the present day of the MCU, the way they're treating the Iron Man character in the 616 universe, he's completely gone. Like, we haven't seen any kind of AI technology where he left his consciousness around. In the comics, he pulled a very Jarvis twist with his consciousness where he was still kind of around. And even though it seemed like he died, they preserved his body. And then Marvel Comics went through a bunch of big changes and they just sort of redid the Iron Man comics with a new number one. In the MCU, their big plan for the Iron Man character long term is basically to bring him back during Avengers 6 Secret Wars using a multiverse kind of twist so they don't have to walk back the sacrifice of the 616 Iron Man at the end of Avengers Endgame. Like, they still want to have that very powerful moment. He sacrificed himself to save this entire universe. Him coming back would kind of walk back that sacrifice. So when Robert Downey Jr. comes back as a version of Iron Man or even as another character, the Sorcerer Supreme version of Tony Stark, it'll be closer to like a multiverse kind of twist. They kind of started to do that during Doctor Strange Multiverse of Madness. They were gonna do a version of Tony Stark from the multiverse with another actor, but because they got John Krasinski to come back as Mr. Fantastic, the Fantastic Four, they got Anson Mount to come back as Black Bolt, and they got Patrick Stewart to come back as a version of Professor X from the X-Men the Animated Series. It was more of an Easter egg for the animated series than it was for the Fox films, but they said that he was meant to be like an amalgam version of all those different versions of Professor X rolled into one. And because they had wanted to get Tom Cruise for Iron Man, but he was too unavailable, busy filming the Mission Impossible sequels, they just opted to not do the character entirely. Like, you know, we'll kind of reference him in the background, but we're not going to do him on screen for a while. So because Iron Man isn't around anymore in the 616 universe, you have Riri Williams at MIT where Iron Man went. He set up all those scholarships. He funded all those programs. It sounds like she benefited from that, like she got in on a scholarship because she's from this very underprivileged family. Iron Man had been one of her heroes growing up, so she took a lot of his ideas and iterated on those, which is why a lot of her scenes seem similar to scenes from the first Iron Man movie, because her character goes through a lot of the same beats, like building her first dumpster dive version of her armor, her Mark I, her cave scene, so to speak. But where it diverges from comic book Ironheart and Iron Man stuff is where you get all the Shuri and the Wakanda stuff. Like, they come to protect her, take her to Wakanda, and she builds her Mark II using all of Shuri's technology, which are completely different ideas, even though a lot of the results seem very similar. We'll still see a lot of Easter eggs and references to Iron Man in the Ironheart series when we get to that, because Black Panther Wakanda Forever is meant to directly set that up. Like, this is the Ironheart series is a direct sequel to Wakanda Forever. But I think what they're trying to do with her plot in Wakanda Forever and all the stuff with Shuri and her technology in Wakanda is separate the Ironheart character from Iron Man so that she doesn't feel like Ironheart Jr. going forward in the MCU. Like she's not meant to be a version of Iron Lad or anything like that. Even though I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions about that going forward. Like is she like a young version of Kang pretending to be Iron Lad in the MCU? Because that would be a crazy twist. I don't think that's the case with this version of Riri Williams, but we might see a version of that in the future where we see a young version of Kang just pretending to be Iron Lad like he does in the comics. Speaking of Kang, I'm also kind of hoping that they use Rama Tut as a character inside the new Fantastic Four movie. That would actually be pretty crazy because Doctor Doom isn't supposed to be the villain of the next Fantastic Four movie. I've already done a couple of Doctor Doom videos, so I'll link those in the description below. I'll talk more about him after Black Panther Wakanda Forever comes out because there is a little bit of Doctor Doom stuff going on in the background in the movie, but not as much as people think, and he's not like a huge character or anything like that in the movie. We won't actually see him on screen for a while, but later on we'll find out how he was involved in a lot of the things that were happening right now. Like it was Doom all along kind of energy, Agatha all along, but with Doctor Doom. The other big question I know people have is what is Namor's role in the MCU going forward? Because obviously they want to play him like more of an anti-hero. He's not meant to be a true villain in this movie, even though he is a huge asshole in the comics. So the whole idea is you have to remember is that Talokan, even though it's underwater, has basically all the same stuff that Wakanda does. They have access to all this underwater vibranium, they have all this advanced technology, and one of their big advantages is because their bodies evolved to live at that depth underwater, they're way more resilient, way faster, way stronger. So they're a little bit more like the Asgardians, like this low level super soldier army that they can use in battles even above water. In a water-based battle, their advantage multiplies by like tenfold. There is a big water battle during Wakanda Forever, so obviously we'll be talking about that. The other difference with Namor is that he's a full-blown mutant, whereas the rest of his people are not. That's how he can fly. He also has most of the same powers that Captain America has, just a little bit better. Like he's a little bit more resilient, a little bit faster, a little bit stronger than Captain America. 
and he's covered head to toe in vibranium, whereas Captain America only had the shield that was vibranium. So heading into something like Avengers 5 King Dynasty, you could use Namor as just a really badass fighter during the movie, but during Avengers 6 Secret Wars, when you have all the rest of the multiverse combined into that one single battle world scenario, he can become ruler of all of Earth's oceans and become way more powerful. It just depends on how closely their version of Secret Wars is going to be to the comic book versions of Secret Wars, and I think it's going to be an amalgam of the 80s version of Secret Wars and the more recent version of Secret Wars. With the obvious difference that instead of Doctor Doom being behind everything like God Emperor Doom, it'll be Kang behind everything. Because we're going straight from Avengers 5, Kang Dynasty, to Secret Wars, implying that there's going to be a big cliffhanger like there was during Avengers Infinity War, heading into Avengers Endgame. And the way Kevin Feige is talking too, to invoke more X-Men mutants stuff, by the time we get to that point, it sounds like Kevin Feige wants to have already introduced most of, if not all, the new major X-Men characters. He didn't say that they would release the next X-Men movie before Secret Wars, but he did imply that we wouldn't be waiting that long before seeing a bunch of X-Men characters. If you spotted any other Easter eggs in the trailer footage that I didn't talk about in the video, just write them below in the comments. And like I said, my non-spoilery review will post Tuesday morning. I've got a bunch of other bonus videos planned for next week, so be sure to post all your requests in the comments below if you have any questions about the characters or what's happening next. Everyone click here for my Ant-Man 3 Quantum Mania trailer video with a whole bunch of Kang and click here for my new House of the Dragon season two video. Thank you so much for watching. Everyone stay safe and I'll see you guys in the next one.